Hey there, and good morning, everybody. Pastor Sven here from Gateway of Hope. It's Tuesday morning, and I am uh, getting ready to get my day started. Thank you for getting up early this morning and joining me, or at whatever time you see this video. Thanks for joining. Uh, if you are reading with us on our 90-day reading plan today, you will be uh, you get an easy day. Today is one of our catch-up days. And uh, if you finish the book of Acts yesterday, you only have to read one chapter today, and that is Romans chapter 1. And we wanted to keep Romans 1 uh, distinct so that we could have a good time of teaching around that because I know it causes a lot of confusion for folks. So today, just Romans 1. If you are behind, this is your catch-up day. Uh, read up through Romans chapter 1, and then after that, pick up three little chapters a day, and uh, you will be able to complete the entire New Testament with us in 90 days. If you have not started yet, today, pick up Romans 1, and when we get all the way through to the book of Revelation, you go back and you do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, three chapters a day, and you two will have accomplished reading the New Testament within 90 days. All right, then today, of course, is our day of prayer and fasting. Uh, remember that uh, we are all going to be pushing away our lunch meal today. We take that time to feed our spirit man, uh, to take some time to pray for the needs of our church. Uh, remember, we're not doing selfish praying during this. It's not about, Lord, bless me and help me and touch me. It's, Lord, touch the people in our body who are in need of healing, in need of wholeness. Uh, believe the Lord with us, if you would, as you are praying for Pastor Elisha and the land that they are believing the Lord for there next to the church in India. Uh, pray for Pastor Spencer and the church in Bagu as they uh, are facing some financial difficulty, but we believe the Lord to bring them out of that as the people there learn how to give. Uh, pray for uh, the upcoming miracle and healing service that we will be having at Gateway uh, with a date to be announced. Believe the Lord to prepare us for what he desires to do. All right, so we are in Romans chapter 1 this morning, and I love Paul's epistle to the Romans. It is the first of, it's the longest of his epistles, and um, history tells us it was written um, about in the year 55, most likely while Paul was in Corinth waiting to make his journey uh, to Jerusalem, where he would be uh, taken prisoner, where he would uh, or the accounts from the latter part of the book of Acts that we just ended up reading uh, would have occurred. So he is writing, and he is writing to a group of Christians that has formed there. Now, I know that tradition has told us that either Peter founded the church in Rome or Paul founded the church in Rome, but actually, Scripture doesn't back that up. Uh, it appears that as... Uh, 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 as some people got, came into Rome from, after Pentecost, they arrived in Rome and they began to share the message of Jesus without any apostolic covering whatsoever in Rome. And uh, it's quite amazing when you consider the fact that you have to admire the faith of these people to accept this new message without the apostles present and without really probably any of the great signs and miracles that we see occurring in Jerusalem and in some of the other areas where the apostles are ministering. Anyway, in Romans chapter 1, Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are split and divided into two camps. You have the, the, the Jewish Christians who are demanding uh, that the Gentiles observe the letter of the law, and in that they are demanding that the Jew, that the Gentiles be circumcised, that they do not eat uh, uh, pork, that they only eat kosher food, that they keep all of the laws and the rituals and the customs of the Jews. And you have the Gentile Christians who are from the side of, oh, it's just, I can do whatever I want and everything is okay. Grace, 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 grace. Really, it's the same division that is, exists in the body of Christ even to this day. You have the extreme legalists on one side and the extreme grace people on the other side. And really we end up finding that the balance of God is right down in the middle. And so Paul is writing to these folks and uh, he's addressing both of these warring factions. 
One of the things I first see here, though, as we are looking in Romans, is you begin to see what it means to be under an apostolic covering uh, and why God gave us the fivefold and why God gave us the apostles. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, it says, This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ, Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. First of all, nobody makes an apostle. God chooses those who are the apostles, just as God chooses those who are pastors and teachers and evangelists. And, uh, but the first thing we see for an apostolic covering is that the person who is covering you in ministry should be someone chosen by God and sent by God. It's one thing to be chosen. It's another thing to be sent to go do the thing that you are tasked to go do. My friend, if you've been called by God, wait until he sends you. Don't go before the sending. If you do, you're likely to cause more damage than good. Wait to be sent. Be chosen, then be sent. Uh, apostles have been given authority. We see in, in verse 5, through Christ, God has given us the privilege and the authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere um, and what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him. And so if you have if you are chosen by God and if you have been sent by God, you will receive the authority to do what it is that you are been called and chosen to do. Then we begin to see what makes somebody, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what the covering looks like. Those of you who are in ministry will understand this. And those of you who are under the cover of someone understand, will understand here from this passage. In verse 9, it says, Day by day, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God. So the, the, my covering or the people that I cover, I should be praying for. I should be laying them before God day and night. You see, the needs of the people of Gateway of Hope become a priority for me as the shepherd of Gateway of Hope, as the pastor and as the apostolic covering of that church. It's my obligation to make those needs greater than my own and to lift those needs to God in prayer day and night. And then it says, I serve you, serve them with all my heart. With everything that's in us, those who are called in the ministry should serve, should be faithful and to be committed. As we saw in the book of Acts, it, we need to be in it for the long haul. We can't just take a nilly vanilla approach. We can't just do things half-heartedly. But if we are going to be covering someone spiritually, then number one, we must pray for their needs day and night. And number two, we must be willing to serve with all of our heart. In verse 11, it goes on to say, For I long to visit you so that I can bring you some spiritual gift to help you grow stronger in the Lord. Our spirit, As we are uh, under spiritual covering, we should be getting something from that. And what we should be getting from them is a spiritual gift, an impartation. I always tell young ministers, so don't just share knowledge, share revelation. Bring truth, but bring revelatory truth. Make, bring something, bring a fresh rhema word that will cause those under your charge to grow spiritually. If we just keep feeding the same stale word that we've been preaching over and over and over again, our people will die. But those of us who are called in the ministry and those of us who are called to serve and to cover others, our obligation is to cause them to grow by what it is that we impart into their lives. In verse number 13, it says, I want to work with you. I want to work among you so that I will see spiritual fruit. Providing spiritual covering is not an easy thing. It's a task. It's an arduous labor. It takes patience. It takes a lot of hard work. My friend, if you will be faithful, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says that if you will continue, be steadfast, ever vigilant, always abounding in the work of the Lord, then your labor will not be in vain. But it is a labor. And for me, it is a joy. It is a joy for me to labor in this thing that I do. But I don't do it in order to get some claim or credit. I do this because I desire to see, to see spiritual fruit grow and develop in the lives of the people that I come into contact with. Now, not everybody who's watching this is called into the five-fold ministry. Not all of you are apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, or evangelists. But every one of you are called 
to disciple someone. Every one of you are called to mentor someone. Every one of you, therefore, are called to be somebody's spiritual covering. And I want you to make it your point today to be committed to do the work, not for any other purpose, but to see spiritual fruit. And don't despise the day of small beginnings. It takes time for fruit to develop. It takes time for young believers to mature. Don't give up on them prematurely. Continue to be steadfast in working with them. And then I love how he says that I have a sense of obligation. My friend, this is my obligation. I am here to do what it is that I'm called to do, and I have no choice. The uh, uh, Peter said, where else could I go? Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. Of course, Romans 1 is also such a marvelous passage of Scripture, but it's often been used against people who identify as GLBT. And I just want to touch on that real fast, because if some of you have read this this morning, you've probably had some remembrances of how these verses have been used and twisted against you. Because we see here in verse uh, 21, it says, They knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God or give Him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their mind became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they became utter fools. Instead of worshiping a glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal life, eternal praise. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. And here's the verses which are used, the clobber passages. It says, Even the women turned against their natural way to have sex and indulged in sex acts with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other, doing shameful things <coughs> with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved. And since they thought it foolish to not acknowledge, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to the foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. And of course, we're often here. Oh, there it is. It's all about those gay people. This is what God has done to them. They did. But we must remember, Scripture is interpreted by reading the Scripture itself. And let's remember the context of the book of Romans. This has been written to a group of Christians who are at odds with each other, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The Jews saying, you've got to keep the law because our way is right. The Gentiles saying, no, I can do anything that I want because grace covers it all. And Paul is writing this entire book in order to set straight the path that God has set out for them. And in this passage, He's dealing with the Jewish Christians, the Jewish Christians who are pointing their finger and saying, you bad, evil Gentiles, you reprobates, you walked away from God, and you do all of these other things. And actually, Paul is setting up a case here against them. Let me read you a passage from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, to put into context what we just read. In Exodus, chapter 32, it says, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when these people saw it, they proclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw how excited the people were. So he built an altar in front of the calf. And he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival unto the Lord. And the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they <coughs> indulged in pagan Revelry, of course. Then we know that God speaks to um, uh, God speaks to uh, uh, Moses up on the mountain and says, "You better go down there and check and see what your people are doing." But if you begin, if you read the scripture in context with the rest of the scripture, 
then you begin to understand that what Paul is describing in Romans chapter 1 is not GLBT people. He's describing the people of Israel themselves who knew God, who they knew him implicitly. He had spoken to them. He had led them out into the wilderness. And yet they decided to exchange the truth of God for a lie. They began to worship created things, a golden calf, who, by the way, Moses, Aaron said, well, we don't know. We just threw our gold into the fire and this thing jumped out. They, thinking themselves wise, they became fools. And then it even talks about that they indulged, that after they had begun to worship this idol, they began to indulge in pagan revelry. By the way, pagan revelry is a very polite way of saying that they basically had a religious orgy. And they exchanged their natural way of having relations, the men with the women, married couples doing what they were supposed to do up to this point, and they began to have sex with each other in worship of this idol. And Paul even goes on and he says, not only did they do this, God abandoned their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should not be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. This is verse 29 of Romans 1. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They have even invented new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, and yet they do them anyway. And worse yet, they encourage others to do so too. Now, I know our study today ends with Romans chapter 1, but finish it out. Take it to the next verse, because chapter 2, verse 1 is important. Because at this point, Paul has all of the Jewish believers just eating out of his hand. Because he's, they're thinking he's not talking about them, he's talking about the, about the Gentiles. And Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others have done these very same things. So my friend, if you're a GLBT believer, don't think that God condemns you. This ver these verses don't condemn you. They would condemn you if you had exchanged the truth of God for a lie. But my friend, you have been, you know the truth. Jesus said, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So go walk in the truth today. Go live out the truth of God. And most importantly, share the truth with everybody with whom you come into contact. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. And Lord, as we, Father God, go about what it is that we are have been chosen by you to do, what we have been called by you to do, as we walk in the authority that you have given to us. Lord, as we pray and lift up those that you have placed under our charge to be discipled, Lord, let us be faithful, that Father, that we can bring them some sort of a spiritual gift that we will be able to impart into lives even today on this Tuesday. Lord, cross our paths, Lord, with those to, into whom we can impart a spiritual blessing, Lord. And Lord, let us continue to work hard, Lord, with those that you have placed and entrusted into our care that we might see some spiritual fruit grow. Lord, remind us of our obligation to serve you. And Father, I thank you for the promise of your word that all who come to you, you will in no wise cast out. So for my GLBT brothers and sisters who may be watching today, who may feel that they have been pushed away and have had these verses used again, them, Lord, today I pray they would find the hope that comes from the knowledge of the truth of God's word the truth that, it, that you proclaimed and not just somebody said that you said. Father, today use us. Let us be your hands, your feet, your mouth. Lord, let us speak. Let us go and be a blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, my friends, I've enjoyed this morning. It's time for me to get on my way and get off to work. I pray you have a phenomenal morning. Remember, our worship's not over. Our service is just beginning. Go be the people of God. If you're in Houston, Church will be open at 7.30 tonight for prayer. Remember, fast lunch today and take that time and lay before the Lord. I love you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.